for coming to our first that I know of nighttime lecture series which I'm excited to experiment with um, and this series is technically called the Ast astronomy from ancient to modern times and tonight we will focus on the history of astronomy um, luckily for you I will not be doing this lecture series because I <laughs> know nothing, barely nothing about astronomy. But we do have Professor Emeritus. Did I say that correct? Yes, I always mispronounce that word. Um, but we have Professor Emeritus Aaron Martin from G, oh gosh, I'm just, Guilford Tech. I am just not doing well with my public speaking today, and I do apologize. Um, but he has played a crucial part in the creation of the what's it? Astronomy. astronomy program in itself, which we were talking yesterday, which there's only two community colleges in the state that we are aware of that offer this program. So he was very integral in the creation of that. But like I stated, tonight's program will focus on the history of astronomy, and this will be a weekly series at 7 p.m. on Wednesdays. But since I don't know anything about astronomy, could you please help me welcome Aaron Martin? Thank you, Mary. And if at any point I'm not close enough to the microphone for you to hear me, please let me know, and I will try to redeem that problem. It's a pleasure to share with you in a field that I got started as an amateur. In fact, some time I might even tell you a little bit of the background. It was actually a Sunday school teacher who gave me a gift of $1 from which I purchased the Golden <coughs> Nature Guide to Birds, <laughs> loved it, and later saw the Golden Nature Guide to Stars. And that one dollar has had an Im incredible impact. And I can tell you more of that story later sometime if you like. <clears throat> okay, tonight, any field has a historical background. <coughs> And that's what I want to share with you a bit of tonight. <clears throat> so, where do we begin? There's the historical period and a bit about the nature of science. If anybody tells you now, science proves this, <laughs> please don't believe them. Because science proves nothing. Good science will say, this is the best we know at the present. And when better information comes along, we'll change. And that has been true over and over. And you're going to see a lot of that in the historical aspect of astronomy, because there has been a lot of change. So where do we begin? Well, people everywhere have looked up at the stars. Anybody who can see and lives without lights, which sadly we don't hear. I used to tell my students I should give extra credit for shooting out street lights. <laughs> anyway, but if you have access to the sky, you are going to look up and you're going to see a lot of things. And so we don't know actually where the actual beginnings happened, but we'll follow a bit of it. The classical period, and what we're going to follow is basically the classical Greek period. Now, astronomy happened in China, it happened in India, it happened in the Americas, but the mainstream of astronomy that leads to where we are today happened pretty much in the classical period, and we'll look at that. There were, there were dimensions in Egypt. Um, there were dimensions in China. There were dimensions in India. There are records from 
ancient observations here in the Americas. So it's happened in a lot of places. For the Egyptians, they labeled a lot of features. The astronomers of the Egyptians were the priests. And one of their important functions was to observe the timing of the appearance of certain stars. Because when certain things appeared, it meant the Nile was about to flood and the beginning of the season for planting was very important. So that is part of what was going on. But we pick up primarily with the ancient Greeks and what I refer to the ancient Greeks should probably really say the ancient Mediterranean cultures because uh, it wasn't strictly Greece. There is Pythagoras. Ah, you remember the Pythagorean theorem? Okay. Well, whether Pythagoras came up with the Pythagorean theorem or the, the observations, we don't know. But certain scholars had schools, that is, disciples, students. And anything that came out of that school carried the name of the master. And that was Pythagoras. Of course, as you know, it was Columbus who discovered the Earth was round, right? Oh, no. no. That's crazy. Where that notion ever got started, I don't know. But Pythagoras, over 500 BC, before 500 BC, established that the Earth was round. How did he do it? Well, take a look. There are eclipses, and you've probably seen an eclipse of the moon. And what do you notice about the shape of the shadow? It's always a round shadow. And from that, Pythagoras said, ha, the Earth has to be round. In fact, Columbus used the ancient ideas to establish when he set out to sail that there was a round earth, so he wasn't going off in a crazy thing. By the way, if you want to interrupt me at any time and have a question, you may do so. I'll also take time at the end for questions. And uh, I won't kick you out for being a bad student if you interrupt me. <laughs> Not only did they know that the earth was around, but Anaxagoras, explained eclipses, knew that there, the eclipse happened, the eclipse of the moon happens when the moon moves into the Earth's shadow, and uh, there's the penumbral phase, which just darkens it a bit, and then it moves into the solid shadow cone, and you get the umbra, and then there's the total. And by the way, when you see the red moon of an eclipse, that's just because the Earth's atmosphere bends some of the light around. People make a big fuss over the red moon, which I think is crazy. But anyway, mm -hmm. that's beside the point. Mm -hmm. Then there was Aristotle. Aristotle established that not only was there uh, various bodies, but things were at different distances because periodically the moon will occult a planet. And occultation is when it moves in front. And you may have never seen that, but I've watched these already where the moon moves in front of a body and it occults the body behind. Well, guess what? That means the moon has to be closer. So there has to be some structure to the solar system. Not only was it known that the Earth was round, Eratosthenes, a couple centuries BC, measured the size of the Earth. Now, how in the world do you measure the size of the Earth? Well, Eratosthenes knew that there was a well in Syene, and on the first day of summer, the sun shone directly to the bottom of the well, only on the first day of summer. Guess what? That makes a good calendar marker as well. But from further north, 
he observed that it, the sun was not directly overhead at noon. And so by measuring the angle from directly overhead to the sun, he was able to establish, and if you recall any geometry, the sun's rays are going to come in parallel. So these are two parallel lines. This becomes a transversal. And if you recall, these angles have to be equal. So he measured that that angle was seven degrees. So all you then have to know is the distance from Syene to Alexandria. Multiply that by the number of seven degrees to go all the way around the circle. And you have the size of the Earth. It turns out that Eratosthenes measured the distance in stadia. And there's one problem. The Greeks had two sides for their stadia. So which was it? Depending which one it was, he was off by about eh, maybe 20%. But if he used the other one, he was quite accurately correct. Now, we don't know because we don't know which stadium he was using. But I'm quite sure that he used the correct one. <laughs> why, why do I think so? We went down to chase the solar eclipse in Mexico one time. And I measured the angle of the sun from our home and then down in southern Mexico. Did it very crudely. And by doing it very crudely, I got a fairly decent measurement for the circumference of the Earth. And I wasn't even trying very hard. So I'm sure that if Eratosthenes was trying, which I'm sure he was, I'm sure he must have used the correct stadium. At any rate, so it's not only that they knew that the Earth was round, they knew the size of the Earth. There's Hipparchus. <clears throat> it turns out that there were lots of measurements and maps of the sky. <clears throat> and by comparing the sky that Hipparchus saw, he compared it with an old, older star maps and discovered that the pole of the Earth was pointing in a different direction. So he discovered that the Earth's axis had a wobble to it. Now we don't know for sure. Uh, Hipparchus also m made a star map. And we don't know for sure, but the Farnese globe appears to be a replica of the map that Hipparchus made. So there were lots of good maps of the sky that were kept for a long time. <clears throat> we then come to Plato. Now what's Plato's contribution? It's the approach. How do you solve a problem? Well, how do we solve problems? We solve some problems by voting. Where do we? We, so <laughs> we solve some problems by discussion by research, and so on. Plato's approach was to figure things out by reason. You think things through. Well, does that always work? Sometimes it does. Sometimes I'm not so sure. Anyway, that was his approach. And so Plato tried to figure out, what is everything made of? His conclusion? There's earth, there's air, there's fire, there's water. Well, come to think of it, what do you know of that doesn't come from the earth, from water, or from air? Yeah. <laughs> but then there was a problem. And the problem was when you look up at the sky. Because there were the heavenly bodies. And they didn't quite behave. And so the heavenly bodies must not have been made of fire, air, earth, and water. So what are the heavenly bodies made of? Well, they're heavenly stuff, ethereal stuff. Because you can see that 
heavenly bodies do some strange things. Now, there's this, here's a star field. And I want you to notice this. These are repeated photographs of the same star field, except, wait a minute, if these are repeated, what's going on here? Well, it's proceeding, and then if you keep watching, it goes for a while, and then it stops, then it backs up, stops, and then goes forward again. That's called retrograde motion. And what does this kind of thing? It was the planets that did that. The moving bodies. Because if you look at stars from night to night, they'll always be in the same, well, they aren't always in the same position, but as from our perspective, they're in the same position. In your lifetime, you won't see a star move from one position to another. But the planets will. They are the wonders. In fact, the word planet comes directly from the Greek. It is the wandering bodies. The planetas, or something like that. Plan planetas. Ruth is much better at Greek than I am. Uh, but these are the wandering bodies. So, how do you account for that? Because if everything, well, what do you see? Everything's going around us. So, how does everything go around us? Well, there, the conclusion was that the earth was fixed. Do, do you feel like you're moving now? And if you think you're moving, could you point which direction you're moving right now? I'll bet you can't. So, we're pretty stationary. And so the Earth was fixed in the center, and around the fixed Earth, well, how do you see, because they're not all the same distance, because we saw the moon was in front of some other objects, so they concluded there must have been crystal spheres turning within each other. One sphere, and each planet had its own sphere. And how many planets are there? Well, how many moving bodies are there? Well, there's the sun, the moon, there's Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter. Did you ever hear of Sunday, Mon Monday? Not quite as obvious on Wednesday, but then there's Thor's day, and not quite as obvious on Friday, but then there's Saturn's day. There were seven moon. Hmm. If there were seven moon bodies, could that be where our seven day week came from? Hmm. Interesting. Anyway, so how do you account for motion like this, this retrograde motion? What would make something move and stop? And by now, things had evolved so that the heavenly bodies had to move in perfect circular motion. Well, if things are going in circular, perfect circular motion, how do you count for the backup? Well, Ptolemy, and by the way, some people thought that the Earth was the worst of places in the universe, and others had different opinions, and we'll get to the, that in a moment. So there was the retrograde motion. Now, how do you account for that? Well, if everything moves in a perfect circle, then you have a fixed Earth, and here is the planet, but to account for the backup motion, it's going on another smaller circle. The center of the circle moves on the center of the larger circle. And if you look carefully, you'll notice up about here, it stops momentarily and backs up. Right there, it stops, backs up, goes forward. That's the retrograde motion when you look at it against the background stars. And so the, by the combination of circle upon circle, and by the way, every planet required not only two circles, they had lots of circles. 
That was a lot of Ptolemy's contribution. And that brings us pretty much to the end of the classical Mediterranean cultures. So we move on to the Renaissance. Copernicus through Newton. And there's the Gutenberg's printing press. So what does that have to do with astronomy? Well, nothing in a way and everything, because ideas now could be spread far and wide. How many books would you have if you had to copy every book by hand? I'm telling you, the printing press re revolutionized things. And so it allowed ideas to spread widely and very popularly. And into this setting comes Copernicus with the Copernican Revolution. Now there was a debate. Is the Earth the center of the universe? Or is it the Sun that's the center of the universe? And in some cases, as I said, the Earth was the worst of places to be. In other cases, it was the best. And when the Christian church got involved, where would God send his son except to the center of the universe? So, yeah. And for others, nothing but the pits would qualify for the center. Because if you're stuck at the bottom, where would, where would it be worse? Copernicus never proved anything, but he published an idea to say, you know what, you can explain for the motion of the planets by assuming that they're going around the sun instead of around the earth. Copernicus hesitated to publish his ideas, and his work was published in the year of his death. For Copernicus, that might have been a fortunate thing, <laughs> because when the idea was disseminated, well, it hit the fan. <laughs> and uh, a lot of debate happened. Uh, an astronomer friend who just passed away recently, Owen Gingrich, did a lot of research on Copernicus, tried to track down every existing work that uh, was done and printed from the early works of Copernicus. And he tracked down hundreds of them all over the world. People said it was never read, but he established quite clearly from the footnotes that it was read extensively. <clears throat> well, after, after Copernicus, there's Tycho Brahe. In a way, the only way to properly describe Tycho and he was known by Tycho rather than, more so than Tycho Brahe. Perhaps the best way to describe him is a, a big, great big fat slob. <laughs> but what difference does that make? Well, you know, it doesn't matter. In the sciences, it's not whether you're a slob or not, but what kind of work do you do? And Tycho probably built the best pre-telescope instrument to measure positions in the sky. This was his sextant, and he was able to measure positions so accurately that he could practically tell the difference between the top edge and the bottom edge of Venus visually without a telescope. That's how accurate his work was. There were a few Muslim uh, astronomers that did some fantastic work as well. But Tycho's work, uh, he had a, an island that he basically built and had his own observatory and pretty well ran it as his own domain. Now, Tycho considered the possibility of an Earth-centered or a Sun-centered solar system. But he said, Ah, oh, but if there's a sun-centered, there should be parallax. 
Now I want you to do a simple experiment that will help you understand parallax. <clears throat> this you can do for yourself. Take your two fingers, put one finger close to your face, and the other finger at arm's length. It's always fun to see how many adults you can get to do something <laughs> stupid. <laughs> okay, now with your two fingers, one close to your nose, the other at arm's length, quickly move your head from side to side while you're glancing at both fingers. What do you notice? What does it look like? It shifts. It shifts, that's right. Which one shifts? The close one. Yeah, if, you, if, if you're moving side to side looking at both, the close one appears to move. Don't put your fingers against your nose. Keep the, fing uh, keep the fingers away from your face so that it is your face moving, not your fingers. That phenomena is called parallax. It is the apparent motion of a foreground object against the background. When you're driving down the road, what do you notice? Telephone poles zipping by, and then you look off at a distant mountain, and it doesn't seem to be moving. That's a parallax phenomenon. So, if the Earth was in orbit around the Sun, unless all stars at the same distance, shouldn't the foreground stars appear to move against the background? Tycho was a good observer and he knew it. And he looked for parallax and didn't find it. So his conclusion was, he was convinced that the Ptolemy system was wrong, but he couldn't figure out what was correct. So he started to develop a model of the solar system that had the sun fixed in the center. The earth then went around the sun, and then the other objects went around the earth, as the whole system went around the sun. Never finished it, but one of his last contributions was he hired a young man by the name of Johannes Kepler. Now, it turns out that Tycho wanted the new system to be named after Tycho. Vanity is not a new thing. And so, uh, he didn't quite get it done. So he hired this young astronomer to help him. Now, Kepler wasn't that interested in working for Tycho, but he knew that Tycho had the best data on the positions of things in the sky. And T Kepler wanted the data. Tycho didn't want Kepler to find the data, but he needed help. It turns out that they, it was a good fortune that the two got together. Well, Tycho died, probably from overeating, uh, really is the case. And when, when Tycho died, Kepler, without asking, packed up the data and ran off with it. For both men, for both Tycho and Kepler, that was a fortunate thing. Kepler was sure that Tycho's crowd wouldn't know how to use the data wisely, and he was probably right. And while they objected for a little bit, they didn't really care because uh, Kepler didn't take the valuable instruments and all the island of the, all uh, Tycho's domain, so they didn't fuss much. But along came Kepler, and what did Kepler do? Kepler came up with the three laws of planetary motion, and let me explain them. Keep in mind that everybody knew that orbits had to be perfect circles. Have you ever heard that a circle represents perfection? Has no beginning and no end? Does that make it perfect? Set it? Equal. <laughs> equidistant from the center. Anyway, Kepler worked 
over and over again trying to fit circles to the data that, uh, and the most data that Kepler had from Tycho was on the orbit of Mars. He had lots of data, and he tried and tried and tried and fit, tried combinations of circles to make it fit. He came up with the best that anybody had ever had, but his conclusion, he was awful by a little bit, and he said, no, Tycho couldn't have been off that much. And finally, after years of trying, he finally tried something else. Instead of a circle, he tried an ellipse. And almost immediately, he solved the problem. So the orbit of the planets, instead of being perfect circles, turns out to be elliptical. So why did it take so long for everybody to see it? If it was an ellipse, shouldn't it be obvious? Well, the answer is no. If I had a chalkboard here, I would show it to you, because when I was teaching the classes, I used to draw an ellipse that matched the orbit of Mars and put a circle beside it of the same size. And I asked students to tell which was which, and they couldn't. Because remember that a circle is equidistance. As soon as you get off the center the little bit, you're to an ellipse. And the ellipse for the orbit for Mars, which is one of the largest of the planet elliptical characteristics, is so small that my students couldn't tell the difference between a circle and the orbit of Mars. So that's why they missed it for so long. His second pleased him a lot better. It's called equal areas, law of equal areas. Now, imagine, here's the sun, and imagine you had an elastic st uh, string going out to the planet, and it was on a plane that was dusty, and as the elastic string went around, it would sweep off part of the plane. In six months, it would sweep off that much. But when it was further away, it wouldn't sweep off as much. But the area of this region is the same as the area of that region. So the law of equal areas says that in equal periods of time, the planet will cover equal area of the orbit. That's the law of equal, of equal area. And his third, Kepler would have really like this one, because it was mathematical. It's called the harmonic law. What it says is if you, instead of a radius on a ellipse, you have what's called the semi-major axis. The major axis being the largest distance, half of it is the semi-major axis, which corresponds to the, area, uh, to the radius. And if you take the time that it takes for a planet to orbit the sun and the length of the same major axis, you cube the semi-major axis, square the time, they're equal. And that kind of mathematical thing just delighted Kepler all over the place. That's the kind of genius he was. Kepler's name almost replaced Newton's. Because with just a couple steps, he would have, we would know about Kepler instead of Newton, but he didn't quite, quite go far enough. We move then to a contemporary of Kepler. You'll notice Kepler is 1571 to 1630, contemporary, Galileo. So what's Galileo's contribution? Galileo did not invent the telescope. He heard about it, and just having heard about it, that gave him enough an idea that he went and built his own. So what did he do? Well, remember, the heavenly bodies represent perfection. So they've got to be perfect spheres, everything around, everything else. What did he see when he looked at the moon? He saw there were mountains and valleys. Well, that's not a perfect sphere. And when he looked at the sun, he saw there were sunspots. Why well, didn't blind himself looking at the 
I don't know. He may have partially blinded himself using, I wouldn't take a telescope and look at the sun, but he did see sunspots. And then when he looked at Jupiter, he saw something else amazing. He saw four little dots. And when he watched from night to night, they moved around. Well, what does that look like? That's like a sun-centered solar system. So rather than an Earth-centered and everything going around with epicycles and so on, that looked like a sun-centered system. You've probably heard that Galileo ended up in house arrest, and he did. And he was right, the church was wrong, except I will partly come to defense of the church because Galileo was a little bit of an arrogant whatever. <laughs> uh, and so he had personal contacts with the Pope. So at one point he told the Pope, let me write a treatise about the Copernican system just so the rest of the world knows that the Italians are not ignorant about these things, and agreed that he wouldn't defend one side or the other, he'd just present the facts. Well, it turns out, as Galileo presented it, it was a debate between two guys. There was, one was Simplicio, I forget what the name of the other one was. There was, a, there was a third guy. Galileo always presented his ideas through the smart guy. He presented the, the Ptolemy ideas through the stupid guy and included some of the Pope's ideas with the stupid guy. And, and the third guy always caught on to the smart guy. So, yeah, Galileo was persecuted, but um, he was partly, so he partly had a, well, I don't defend the church, but I don't totally defend Galileo either. Anyway, following Galileo and Kepler, <clears throat> there's, wow, sir. He was knighted. There's Isaac Newton. And Newton himself said, if I've seen further than people before me, it's because I stood on the shoulders of giants, referring to Galileo and Kepler. And their works contributed significantly to his. Newton did a lot of great stuff. He did a lot of stuff that wasn't so great. We don't hear about that. But some of his work in alchemy and so on. Uh, it's kind of interesting to read his work. But of course, we're aware. <laughs> I know we talk about scientific laws. In a sense, that's unfortunate. Uh, it really ought to be better scientific theory. And remember that, as I said, it's the best that we have at the moment. When we come up with better, we'll do better. <laughs> okay. There were the Herschels, William and Carolyn Herschel. Uh, they mapped the sky in incredible detail. That telescope had a diameter of 60 inches. It was the largest in the world. Uh, William would ride up the near the front end of the telescope, call down his observations to Carolyn, who recorded them. Both contributed significantly. They were both musicians as well. You can find Herschel's music, classical music. But much bigger telescope. And that brings us up to the modern period, which I 
considered to be right around the turn of the 20th century. <clears throat> so who are some of the players? Ah, you've heard of Albert Einstein. It turns out that Newton's work pretty accurately dis Newton's work was so good that a planet was discovered by calculation before it was seen. The planet Neptune. Uh, Herschel's discovered the planet Uranus and by carefully checking the position of the orbit of Uranus, they said it looks like something else is pulling on it. And by analyzing the positions and calculating, they concluded that there was another planet further out. And that's the way Neptune was discovered. Well, it turns out that Newton's work is good, but it has, it does, it's not as accurate as it should be. And Einstein was able to correct for some of that. And we'll see more about Einstein's work later on. <clears throat> There's also Carl Jansky, 1931. Everything used to be looked at through the light that we see. But Carl Jansky was playing around with some radio transmission and discovered that there was some noise coming from the sky. And from this, radio astronomy was born. So not only do we look at the sky with the visual light, but we also see in radio. And the sky has been extensively mapped in radio. And we'll see that more later. Which brings us pretty well to the modern period. That's Mount Palomar. So the modern period, and I would like to suggest the modern period is pretty much post-World War II. There, uh, so what are the contributions in the modern period? Well, we have not only visual, but we have better instrumentation now. Telescopes have gotten much larger. The, the largest telescope in the world had been the, the Herschel telescope. And then the largest telescope in the world was a 60-inch telescope on Mount Wilson. I had a chance to work with that. It was kind of fascinating being there because a lot of the greats of astronomy had been there, and you could almost smell in the musty halls the ancient uh, history. But uh, Mount Palomar, where is that? In California, okay. uh, above Pasadena. Yeah, if you if you go above Pasadena, uh, you can actually see the, the Mount Wilson Observatory, and Palomar is above uh, San Diego, uh, northeast of San Diego. And for many years, Palomar was dedicated in 1948. So this is the 75th year of Palomar's observation. Uh, the, for many years, the 200-inch, 5-meter telescope was the world's largest. But it no longer is, because not only have we had various radio telescopes, this was the Arecibo telescope in Puerto Rico. It's a radio telescope that has been carved out of a valley, hollowed out. Unfortunately, Arecibo, the telescope has collapsed and is no longer functioning. And uh, there's still debate whether it will be put back in operation. There's Kitt Peak National Observatory, uh, the largest telescope I ever had a chance to work on was this one. I'm pretty sure that's the one, 84 inch. It was so large that I was able, as we were doing some observations, to lie in the fork of the telescope and write it as it slowly turned. Uh, that was not a night when I was there. 
That was an amazing thunderstorm that night. Where is it? Uh, it's near Tucson, Arizona. Yeah. Uh, Kitt Peak National Observatory has a, a visitor center that anyone can view and visit. Uh, for a couple thousand bucks, you can rent one of the large telescopes out there and spend the night looking. And you can take a group with you if you like. Uh, it was an interesting place to work. I did some of my own research there. There is a series of radio telescopes in New Mexico. Instead of making one big telescope, you can take a series and by putting them further apart, you can make it equivalent to a large diameter telescope. And the biggest telescopes in the world now are in Hawaii. Uh, the double the size of Palomar, two telescopes side by side. Those two, the Keck telescopes, are the, uh, they're not quite the largest, but for practical purposes they are. And the two can work together so they can come up, but, but they are working with they're getting ready to build instead of 10, those are 10 meters in diameter on the reflecting surface. They're now working on some 30 meters, and there's even some discussion of putting up a 100 meter telescope somewhere. So, what are the things that have contributed? I'd like to suggest there are three things that have made the difference. One is the computer, because believe it or not, with the computer, you can design a telescope so that it can support things in much better fashion. The second is the, the CCD cameras, the charge couple device. Your camera that electronically photographs can be much more sensitive than otherwise. So the computer, the uh, CCD, and the other aspect is the satellites, because the atmosphere acts like a, a solid block. You can't see a lot. There's a lot of wavelengths that, uh, that are emitted out there, but they don't penetrate the atmosphere. So the ability to get above the atmosphere is a third contributor. Uh, and my son and I should have acknowledged him in the beginning. My son helped me put together the PowerPoints because my computer doesn't have the PowerPoint program on it. So my son Dan helped me. And Dan says, you should also include the World Wide Web because it's ability to disseminate things. In any case, that gives you a little bit of the history. And I will take any questions that anyone may have, if you have any questions about anything. Yes? Uh, yeah, I think it was the 400th anniversary of Columbus in 1892 when they propagated the myth about people who thought the world was uh, It could black. be. It could and be. Secondly, following up on your uh, item about the, the days of the week, you can also uh, use the uh, motion of the planets to establish which is the first day of the week, because the, the order is not obvious mm -hmm. yeah. just otherwise. Yeah. Oh, the third point about the, the week is the, the correlation is more obvious in the Romance language. Yes, it is. Yeah. 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 Yes. Uh, I'm curious about the ideas about the origins of the universe and the expanding universe, when do those begin to be proposed? The, the idea of origin of well, the expanding universe, and I'll cover that when we, uh, in the fourth presentation on galaxies. The notion of the expanding universe happened with Hubble's work. Uh, Hubble did some of the, uh, 
And Hubble, Hubble uh, his famous paper, and by the way, you can access it online, was I think in 1923, the Astrophysical Journal. So uh, that's, the Astrophysical Journal is now online and you can access, access some of those classic articles. Well, Friedman's uh, paper preceded that. Uh, Friedman is the one that Einstein railed against when Friedman said one of the possible solutions of general relativity yeah. is expansion. Yeah. And Einstein said, no, the universe is static. Yeah, in fact, Einstein fudged his own equations to make the universe stand still <laughs> and discovered that his uh, he shouldn't have done that because if he hadn't done it, he, he may have uh, observed some more profound stuff than he did. Other questions? Well, thank you. And next week... Next week, I'm going to take you on a tour of the solar system. So, we'll, we'll take a look at the solar system. You're welcome. Thank you. I may just end your back. Did you study Harvard? No.